Hi, we have a lot of things that we want to share with you, and today's message is just one of them. I want to invite you to come and participate in our services here. Join us here every Sunday morning at 9.30 for our Bible study. We have different speakers that come, and you, I think you'll enjoy them. Matter of fact, today's message is also one of those. I have a special message for you each and every Sunday morning at 10.30 right here at Crossroads, which meets at Theater 3, 2800 Ruth Street in Howell, right here in Uptown Dallas. So if you have this Sunday off, come and visit with us, and let's go to the service right now. Marvin, who would have been here this morning, but I told him to take the time off, had knee surgery on Friday. So uh, his daughter called me and let me know that he was having surgery and said that he might not be able to be here. And I said, no, he won't be here on Sunday because I'm going to tell him to stay home. He called me this morning about 6.30. He says, I can be there. I can be there. I said, no, you need to stay home and get off that leg. So he uh, will be back with us next week. But we got some other folks out of town. Uh, matter of fact, Doug Fonville, good news. <coughs> he got an invitation from his son, and they've been a little on the outs, a little strange and was invited to come to Waco and to have lunch with him today and to hear him play. And uh, so they're in the service right now and Doug's gonna get to spend the afternoon with his son, which I think is really pretty good. That's a good thing, good thing. So, <coughs> uh, got some things up here. You know, when, when we look at a cross, we see a lot of different things. You know, time rests on it like a diamond does on eternity because it just doesn't quit. It just goes on and on and on. And when I started pulling up these slides of all these different looks at a cross, you know, it's amazing to me that this piece of wood has such a history that people have idolized it for years and centuries gone by. I mean, we have all different kinds of crosses. But that wood has been copied. It has been gold-plated, it has been iodized, it has been given away, it has been immortalized, but there's one thing you can't do, is you can't forget it. And I think it's interesting that the reason why we can't forget it is because someone actually was put to that cross for us, and as we saw earlier, nail prints in his hands to prove it. So all of eternity really starts here for us. It starts here on a hill, and that cross appears for us. Uh, I'm kind of curious today, when we talk about the cross, I know everybody has heard services about what the cross has done and everything like that, but I want us to take a look from Jesus' perspective today on what he saw while he was on the cross. How many of you like to have your picture taken? Anybody? Of course you do, Jonathan. But I, I think about how many times people have had happy faces and they're all happy and joyful. And uh, I know that there are a lot of people out there that are happy today and because they're, they're celebrating that Jesus is alive. I also know that there's a lot of people out there that are disappointed. Things didn't go their way. And uh, I think about how Disappointment hurts, and sometimes we're disappointed in ourselves. The fact that, you know, we could be better than we are sometimes, and I know a lot of times, you know, I, I think it's what, like five, six months now, going on five months, I guess, coming up, that we just had all of our New Year's resolutions, and some of our parts aren't like they should be, you know. Some of our hair is going up, and our bellies are going down. That's really not a good thing. And we're, we're disappointed in ourselves because we can't even keep a commitment for very long, can we? And the thing that I want us to think about today is the fact that, you know what? Matthew tells a story, and we're going to take a look at this story, and we're going to see his perspective of what Jesus saw while he was on the cross. And so I want us to take a look here. We're going to take a look at the scripture. And it starts in Matthew chapter 27, and it, it, it's rather lengthy. It goes to about 54 verses, but... I want us to read this because we're going to kind of take a break as we go. And it says here that as they were going out, Jesus is being cross, has got the cross and he's on the way out into the street. He's been beaten. He's been scourged. He has been, had the, the crown of thorns put on his head. He's weakened because of loss of blood. 
And so now the Roman soldiers are seeing him weak under the bearing of this cross. So they see a man from Serene named Simon. And they forced him. Everybody say forced him. Forced. Say it again. Forced. forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. It's a place there that if you read the story of, which I think is very interesting, you read the last few verses of the book of John, the last chapter of the book of John, Jesus is on the cross and he has seen Abraham. Now you have to remember the story in Genesis chapter 22. Abraham is having to give up his son, Isaac. And it said that Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. He saw this place. God gave him a porthole through time where he could see the day that resurrection would happen. And he wasn't afraid to sacrifice his own son. And here is God sacrificing his son, and it's the same place. There they offered Jesus wine to drink. Of course, we know that it wasn't wine, but it was vinegar mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Everybody say casting lots. Yes. Casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. I want you to think first, just for a moment, about that word that we called a while ago. We called it out, call it being forced. Here's Simon. He was a very common Jewish name. I think it's very interesting. He is a local believer. He is not somebody that has been, you know, come as a pilgrim to Jerusalem. He has lived there. Uh, he's not a pagan. Matter of fact, he has not been tricked in becoming a believer. He's a believer on his own. Uh, he wasn't taken to church for a potluck surf, supper as kind of a guise to get him there. He is here because he wants to be. But all of a sudden, he's being forced to the cross. And I think that's very interesting. When I started looking at this, I thought he was forced to the cross. And in that sentence, it's 20 words in English. It's only 14 words in Greek to announce that he is there for a purpose. He's there being forced to carry the cross. And I thought to myself, you know, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was forced to go to church sometimes. How many were ever forced to go to church? Yeah. I know if Keith were here, he would tell you he was forced to go to church all the time. He and his family went to church every time the doors were opened. How many of you went to church every time the doors were open? And sometimes you didn't want to go, Neil, did you? No, I wanted to stay home and watch TV on Sunday night at 6 30 because that was when the Walt Disney Hour was on. I wanted to do everything. I didn't want to go to church, but my parents forced me to go to church because my mom and my grandmother were Sunday school teachers and su superintendents. We went every Sunday. Sometimes dads feel obligated to go to church because they have to feel like they're setting examples. So they're being forced to go, aren't they? And moms have to take the kids. How many of your mothers took you to church, whether you wanted to go or not? Absolutely. And some people go out of tradition because they feel like, you know, it's Sunday, it's Easter, I've got to go to church. Even pastors feel that way sometimes because we've got to be here to, to give a message for you, just like every other Sunday. You know, I, I think people who have been in ministry, you know, realize that we never have Sundays, really, because we're always working on Sundays. So everyone has a common thread of being forced, whether they really believe it or not. But Simon the Cyrene was forced to pick up that cross and to carry it. Now realize how close he was to that piece of wood. He was on his shoulder. I think that's very interesting. He was carrying this cross. So the first lesson that I wanted to get out of these three pictures that we're going to take a look at, first one is being forced, is first off, he was the closest but he never changed. He was so close, he was carrying that cross, but in all of that, we never see him going back to tell other people how close he was to the very piece of wood that would be symbolized throughout all eternity. He was right there. He was carrying that, but he wasn't doing it because he wanted to. He was doing it because he was forced to do it. There is a, an impact and a difference of wanting to do something because it's 
the right thing to do and something being done because we're being forced to do it. But here's what I want you to remember. You can always be close to the cross and still at the same time far away from Jesus Christ. See, you can go to church. I know people that have gone to church their whole lives but are not close to God at all because they've never decided that it was real enough to invest their time into becoming a part of him. They're part of the institution. They go to church. They worship. You know, uh, when I was going to school at Tulsa, uh, because I had gone to a school that my parents didn't approve of, they didn't give me any money for school, and I was having to work. Uh, so here's a Southern Baptist that got a, got a job in a church, the uh, Holy Family Cathedral. It's the Archdiocese of Oklahoma. I got a job there. And it was very interesting not having come from a Catholic background, all of a sudden being a part of a Catholic church and being a part of the worship and everything. And what I thought was interesting was all the things that I had heard that were so idolized in the Catholic church that really were just rituals, suddenly when I became a part of it, everything had a reason for being there. Every movement, every moment, every ringing of the bell, the smoke, all of that was just, I had never really ever embraced that. See, sometimes you can go and go and go and never find out why you go. Sometimes it's simply because we're forced. The second picture that I want us to take a look at is what we read about it. Uh, churchgoers, religious hypocrites, and just surface believers, people that just go kind of nominally, they go to church, they're not because they really want to go, but they're going again because of peer pressure, that kind of thing. But one of these pictures is the picture that we read here. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. How many of you remember that story? You've all heard that story, right? Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, <laughs> save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. And in the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saves others, but they said, but they, he can't even save himself. The king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. All these things, these snide comments were being made to him, and he is in a place where there's nothing he can do about it. He has gone willingly, not being forced, but going willingly. We talked about it last week. When he went into Jerusalem, he knew that that was going to be the last time he entered in Jerusalem. He knew that. He stepped outside just for a moment before he went into the gates and he looked and he saw the people and he realized that that was the last time he was going. And you know what? He was going for a reason. He knew it and still went. He's on the cross when he could have, like the song says, called 10,000 angels. He had that kind of power, that kind of ability. But he didn't do it because he was willing to do what the Father wanted him to do. So there's three people here, three different kinds of people. One, soldiers. Remember they cast lots? Cast lots for his clothes? You know, I know a lot of people who go to church and they gamble. Not like at casinos, but they're gambling with their very eternity and the fact that they keep putting off that part of wanting to be a part of Jesus. They're, they're, they're putting it off and oftentimes, you know, it's like I've been at the bedside of people when they're old and they haven't lived, you know, what I would consider a godly life. But at the last moment, they're wanting to get saved real quick because they know that eternity is staring them right in the face. I've had the privilege of doing the funeral for my mother, for my dad, for all of my aunts and my uncles. And I remember when my dad's younger brother died. It's been many, many years ago. I had all of our family were there. I mean, my dad's youngest brother was loved by everybody. And he had worked uh, for Gulf Oil for a number of years. He was a principal there and had been a part of that company for many, many years. So there were lots of people from Gulf there. I mean, it was a lot of folks. 
And I told him, I said, you know, you need to look right here. I was pointing to the coffin. I said, every one of us, not withholding anyone, will be here one day. And I said, you know what? You may be thinking that you're looking down the gun barrel of life. <laughs> and you don't need to look at it that way because we're all going to die. These physical bodies are going to die, but the good news is we get to live forever. These people were gambling for his clothes. Some people are gambling with their very life because you know what? You have no idea walking out of this room might lead to. The crowd, you know, they all laughed at him. I think it's interesting that the Bible says that they spat upon him as they went by. You know, here is a Jew, Jesus was Jewish, surrounded by the hierarchy of the, of the temple. They're making fun of him, laughing, jeering at him. But to be spat on by Gentiles and all the people, that was the worst thing. And he should have been allowed to go and be a part of a cleansing ceremony. That's what the temple was for, was for cleansing. And they didn't even offer him that opportunity. They wanted him gone. The religious leaders. You know, sometimes people think that they can get in just because of who they belong to. I'll tell you something. If, if I were going to get in because I've got a good lineage, <laughs> David, you could get in too, couldn't you? How, your dad, and was his dad? Third generation. Third generation in the ministry? I mean, if you had, if you had connection, that would be connection. But you know what? God doesn't have any grandchildren. You can't get in because you were born a part of something else. You only get in there because you're born to him again. So there were all these people making jokes. I mean, it's just a, 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 it's a picture of foolishness, really. So we've got a group of people who were forced at the cross. Jesus is taking this snapshot. He's getting this picture of all these people. He's getting the picture of those people, too. So remember the two thieves? that were taken with him. I think it's very interesting that you read other stories about him. We paint one innocent and the other one guilty. But you know what? They were both guilty. They were both going to the cross for a reason. Both insulted him while, they were, while he was on the cross. Both of them said, well, why don't you just do something? But we have one they're both very close to the cross, but one is changed by that moment. He's changed in the fact that he recognizes that suddenly it comes to him that this is the Son of God. And he makes that connection with Jesus. He says, you know what? Just remember me. Remember me. When you get into, when you get into heaven, remember me. And what did Jesus say? It's, I'm going to. I'm going to. So three pictures. One, out of all the three pictures, there was only two categories of people. <laughs> Those that were touching the cross by choice and the others by chance. You know, I think it's interesting that some of you are here to church today because somebody brought you, somebody invited you. You know what? It really wasn't them. It wasn't them. God gave you an invitation through someone else. I don't know about you, but I've, invited, I've been invited to parties that I wasn't invited by the host. <laughs> I didn't want to go because I didn't know if I'd be welcome or not. But they had invitations that had plus one, plus two, plus three on them. And I was able to get in. And sometimes we're able to get to places because somebody else has an invitation that says plus one, plus two. I think that's a good thing. Let's read on here. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatane, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you imagine the Son of God actually thinking that his Father has forsaken him? I mean, dark is dark, and he's going to the darkest of all places. When some of those standing 
there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on his staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. I think that's very interesting, you know, because that curtain was many feet tall by many feet wide. It was the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Anybody could have torn it from the bottom up. But it was torn from the top down so that we could enter in. There would never be anything between us and God again because Jesus was taking that away. So never we had to go by anyone else. We never had to let anybody else say, can you get me into heaven? No, because now we can come by ourselves. The earth shook and the rocks split and the tombs were open. I think that's very interesting. And bodies of many holy people that had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Last verse. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. There was enough evidence to them to make a difference. They had been a part of something that had transfigured them. Something took place. Three pictures again. When we think about the criminal on the cross, why do we place less value on this picture? When I think about the two criminals, and I think about one, you know, just ranting and raving until he died, and the other one, you know, said, you know, please remember me. When we think about that, remembering this criminal, how come we, we get a little upset with that? I get a little upset with it. I used to a lot. I don't as much anymore. Why? Because in our world, value is me measured by appearance and performance. This guy did nothing to get there. Those people that are old, they're dying, and they want to say the sinner's prayer with a pastor. They want to, they want to. You know, I have heard so many people said, why should they get in? They live 70 some odd years living like a hellion, and then at the final moment, they still get to get in. And everybody that's good and wholesome sometimes has a bad attitude about those people because Jesus will take them anytime. Anytime. It's not about being what other people think you need to be. It's what you need to be to God. And God's waiting there forever. I think that's a most amazing thing. When you think of the story of the prodigal son, here's the guy who has had living lavishly with a very wealthy family, and he suddenly decides, you know what? I want all mine now. And so the father split everything and gave him his half. And what was the other brother like? He was upset. Because, you know what? Money develops more money. And when you take half of the power of that way, the rest of it doesn't build quite as fast. And he was thinking, you know, I'm going to be shorted by all this. And the young brother runs off, lives like a hellion, goes through all of his money. Finally, when all the money is gone, you see the picture of him living very impoverished in the fact that he gets a job with a swine herder. I think this is very interesting because he's Jewish and he's taken a job with a swine herder. And now he's looking at their food that he's feeding them, pig pods. They're like gourds, like dried up squash. He's looking at that and suddenly he's thinking, you know what, that looks pretty good. <laughs> I'm so hungry. That looks good. And he sits there, and the Bible says he came to himself. Recognition of where he was forced him to say, you know what? Even the servants in my father's house live better than this. I would be better off to go and to put myself as a slave in my father's house than to live out here. 
And the picture that we see is Jesus there extending, the father waiting, looking out the window, waiting for his son to come. It's not once in a while. He's there watching every single day. It's as if he has nothing else to do but to wait till you come to him. He doesn't care when you come. That little guy had spent all of his money, and it took him a long time to still figure it out that he had to, he had to do something about it. See, sometimes people go to church, bad things happen, their lives fall apart, they're still going to church, but they don't realize that going to church isn't going to change anything. It's going to Jesus is what's going to change something. That's what's going to make a difference. The problem is so many people don't do that. They're carrying the cross. They're being forced to do something. They're looking at it. They're very close to it, but they still can't touch it. What a picture. Here's the story. Why are we uncomfortable when a, in that picture? A pagan ex-con and a pagan centurion are saved. They're saved. How many times does that centurion probably put people to death? I mean, that was his job. He's carrying out the orders. It's not his you know, desire to do it, but he's still doing it. He's actually there to assist in the crucifixion of Jesus, and he's watching all this, and things are happening. And that ex-con up there, up on the cross, I mean, you know, how come he got to be saved? Here's the thing I want you to think about. We're uncomfortable with these people getting to walk on the golden streets because they know more about the grace of God than a thousand theologians. You see, we think that we have to do something in order to get God to save us. We think we have to be good in order to receive the grace that he wants for us. But you know what? It's not about that. But one of the hardest things to do is to be saved by that grace. Because this statement right here, and then to accept God's grace means we have to realize we're helpless to save ourselves. There is nothing you can possibly do to get into heaven. You cannot do enough. And the good news is you don't have to because it's already all been done. There can be no more sacrifice for getting into heaven than Jesus dying on the cross. Nothing more. So when you think about your life, you think, well, man, my life has been the pits. I've done some things that I wish I hadn't done. I've gone places where I wish I hadn't gone. My feet have taken me all kinds of places, and I wish I've not, never stepped foot in those places. It doesn't matter. Because the grace of God is bigger than that. The grace of God says, you know what? I don't care where you've been, what you've done, who you've hurt, what you've said, not even what you've thought. None of that matters because none of that compares to the power that Jesus went to the cross with to cover all of that up with his blood. So my question today is, what is the picture of your life? If Jesus were to take a snapshot, where would you fit in? Would you fit into one of those people that thought I was forced, you know? I might have been forced, or maybe those people who, the foolish people, you know, just gambling, hoping to go. because we just, We're going to go to church, but we're not going to quite give it up yet because I think I can make it at the last moment. I think that's pretty foolish. Or are you going to be one of those that find forgiveness through grace at that cross? There's a story about a man who lived in New York City. Very wealthy man. Very, very wealthy man. And uh, he was married, had a son. And while the, the little boy was growing up, the mom died of cancer. So it was just the dad and the son. And they grew very, very close because that's all they had. Now, the dad had a hobby. He was an art collector, collected really fine works of art, Rene, uh, Renoir and Bo, uh, Gauguin and some of the other big masters. He collected them, and he had them all throughout his house. And so the son grew up with all of this wonderful stuff. 
And one day he decided that he was going to join the Marines. His dad was really upset, says, please don't, 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 don't. You are the most valuable person I've got in my life, and I don't want to lose you. Well, the son said, you know what? I need to do this. This is my country. So he actually went to and enlisted uh, during the time of the Vietnam War, late 60s, early 70s. And as so many people in that particular war died. And his father was crushed. They were able to bring his body back, and they gave him a, 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 a beautiful funeral. But his dad mourned greatly, greatly, greatly. Several months later, there was a knock at the door, and there was a young military guy, a young Marine, who had lost his arm. Under his other arm, the good arm, he had a painting. And he introduced himself to the dad, and the dad said, well, you know, uh, then won't you come in? And he says, I've got something to tell you. He says, your son took a bullet for me, and that's why he died. And he said, we had been best friends the whole time in boot camp and everything like that. He said, we were really good friends. And he said, I couldn't believe that he stepped in front and saved my life. He lost his. And the father was just weeping. And the other soldier said, you know, I, I have something for you. He said, we were such good friends. I painted a picture of him, and I want you to have it. So the dad unwrapped the picture. Wasn't very good. <laughs> Matter of fact, it probably looked like a Picasso. <laughs> but the dad took pictures down and put that picture up on the wall. And it remained there till he died. Because of all of the estate was all kind of wrapped up because the son and the dad and the mom had predeceased. It was all kind of a mess. It finally got straightened out. And all the art was going up for auction, including this picture of the son. And so all the art collectors were coming in, and they were looking at all the pieces, you know, as the numbers and the lots were coming up for the, for the uh, auctioneer to, to bid on. And as they got there, they were looking at all these pictures, and they saw this one little dumpy picture. And I thought it was very interesting. They got up there, and the auctioneer decided, we're going to start with this one. <laughs> and he, 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 the picture's up on an easel, you know, and it's not a very good picture. And he said, who'll give me a dollar? <laughs> dollar. Anybody give me a dollar? Anybody give me a dollar? Dollar, dollar, dollar. Give me a dollar. Give me a dollar. Give me two dollars. And so a guy way back in the back said, I'll give you two dollars. Sold. The guy comes up, takes the picture. He'd been a gardener to this family in their estate. And he grew up taking care of that farm, the place where they lived, and grew up with that boy. And he said, I want that picture to remember him by. So he took that picture and he walked out. The auctioneer took his gavel, because they were all the art collectors now, we're all getting revved up because all the big pieces are coming on. And the auctioneer banged that gavel down and said, the auction's over. Everybody said, what do, you, what do you mean the auction's over? I don't want to read you the quote that I thought was very, very incredible. I've got to find it. We're out of it. The gardener brought the picture and began to walk down the aisle with the picture, and the auctioneer slapped down the mallet and said, sorry, folks, the auction is over. The will was very specific. Whosoever has the son gets it all. So the gardener, for $2, got all the wealth. My question to you is, what kind of picture do you have today when you think of your life? Is it the picture that you would want God to be taking right now? Is your life the life 
that's been forgiven and you're so thankful like we were singing a while ago. So thankful. Is your life a snapshot of that or something else? I want us to take a moment. I want us to pray this morning. You know what? You have an opportunity to change the picture of the future for yourself. Heavenly Father, this morning, we have seen our picture. Father, some of us may have been forced to church, like Simon the Cyrene, forced to carry the cross. Father, we might be foolish like the people who just went to church and gambled like the, like the soldiers at the foot of the cross. But Father, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that my life has been forgiven. And the grace, the grace that you've provided has covered a multitude of sins. So Heavenly Father, right now we have a chance to change that picture going forward. To change it from one of foolishness and being forced to one of forgiveness at the cross. So Heavenly Father, right now, I want every person to pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I open the door to my heart open the door of my heart and I invite you to come in and I invite you to come in take control take control of the throne of my life the throne of my life and make me and make me the kind of person the kind of person that you want me to be that you want me to be thank you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus for saving me for saving and me and touching me today and touching me today in Jesus name in Jesus name and everyone said we've got a lot to be thankful for. Easter is one of those times. So when you think about the rest of your day and you think about, oh, maybe going to the Pooch Parade, I invite you to do that. If you don't know what that is, you need to find out. It's right over here in Lee Park. You won't be able to park close, so park fairly close and walk and just find a close parking lot. But the good news is, is that, you know, you have fellowship today, not just those around you, but you have fellowship with the Father today. That's unlike anything else. You don't have to be close because you're right there with Him. So let's stand. David, would you sing that for us? Oh, how He loves you and me.
and thank you for watching today's service. As I spoke to you at the beginning, we have a couple of outreaches which I think are important for you to know that we're participating in, and you might want to join us. We've got one, which is our orphanage in Uganda. It's 320 children, about, that have been left there because their parents have either died or are affected by HIV AIDS. There are no relatives that will take them in because it's such a stigma to have HIV or even to be gay there in Uganda. We also have a church in Tegucigalba, Honduras. It's just the starting work, but there is a lot that we can do to help them. And if you'd like to join and be a part of that, we invite you to go to our webpage, www.crossroadscommunitychurch.us, and you'll see a tab there that says donation. You can make your donation through PayPal. It's secure, and we'll get that, and we'll send it on to them. So if you'd like to participate, we thank you for doing it in advance because we know that God is going to bless you. Thank you for watching today, and tune in next week.